when you're seeing your buddies get killed, uh, something automatically snaps in your mind to save their lives. We find ourselves in a situation, you know, and we react. We do the best we can. You know, I was a non-commissioned officer doing my job. It is the greatest honor that can be bestowed upon an American. An American president once said it was greater even than becoming president of the United States. About three days later, <laughs> they, uh, they called me and told me <laughs> I was in for the medal, you know, and uh, the, uh, I didn't even know what it was. Unlike any other award, those few who have received it never sought it at all. They never for a minute believed they deserved it. More than half gave their very life in the act for which they were later awarded this, the nation's highest honor. And in almost every case, they sacrificed their lives solely to save the lives of the men by their side. You're wearing the Medal of Honor to represent all of those that did not come back. Of those who survived to receive the award, only a few became household names or went on to fame and fortune. The stories of a few became the stuff of legend, the great locomotive chase, Chamberlain's charge at Gettysburg, Doolittle's raid over Tokyo. The lives of a few came to define the very meaning of hero in America. Audie Murphy, Alvin York, Eddie Rickenbacker. But some others, we know not even their names. The vast majority never made the history books. Most went quietly home to the towns and cities they loved across America. Still others, lived out their remaining years in poverty and obscurity, all but forgotten by the nation for which they had sacrificed so much. Virtually all of them, though, lived humbly, the burden of such an honor almost more than they could bear. Of the over 40 million men and women who have served in our nation's armed forces, there stands above all a group of under 3,500 individuals, our nation's recipients of the Medal of Honor. Only about 100 remain alive today. This is their story. It is often said that a picture is worth a thousand words. Even with all the technology and advancements of today, so often a single still image is somehow more powerful, more poignant, more profound. It beckons us to stop and grasp what the photographer is trying to say to us. Remember this moment. This moment is important. Whether it be the captured moment of great triumph, or one of great tragedy, or an image of the very second the world was changed, that image is a portrait of time, meant to be studied, cherished, and preserved. Perhaps this is the best way to describe the honor the United States of America holds above all others. 
the Medal of Honor. It has been described as a flash of brilliance, a hole in one, a spark where everything American is perfectly presented and when character and values burst forth unplanned and unrehearsed. As one historian has noted, for all its destructiveness, war often brings out the best in people. It creates a vocabulary of heroism so that, you know, in, in a way, the thing that's amazing about these stories is that they're, they're all, you know, stories of bloodshed, of violence, of killing, but at some other level, they're moral tales. And what they teach is persistence, sacrifice, summoning courage in the face of insuperable odds. I guess it was Aristotle who said, you know, courage is the chief of all virtues. And so this, this courage that these guys have exhibited is something that challenges everybody. And that's why I think why this is such a, such a prestigious medal is because it challenges every human being, whether they're in uniform or not, to live up to that kind of ideal of doing the right thing, you know, when you're called upon to do it. Of the few who have received our nation's highest honor, there have been great men and there have been average men. There have been men who went on to accomplish much and some who did not accomplish much of anything. There have been men who have become household names and one woman known by almost no one. Each exemplified, if only for a moment, what the highest ideals of being an American really are. Courage, selflessness, and action. Such was certainly the case when John Joseph Kelly signed up to fight in World War I. At five foot five and 112 pounds, John Joseph Kelly, or Jackie as he was known by his Marine buddies, looked like anything but the perfect soldier. He was small and scrappy, a rough, undisciplined, hard to control kid, a product of an Irish immigrant family and the tough neighborhoods of the south side of Chicago. At age 16, Jackie Kelly ran away to join the circus, but he was back home by the time World War I broke out, and when his three brothers enlisted, Jackie couldn't resist. He joined the Marines, and after training, his unit was sent directly to the trenches of Verdun. That was on St. Patrick's Day, 1918, a day, by the way, for which the rebellious young Jackie would receive his third court-martial for drinking and fighting. In fact, he received so many pay deductions for all his troublemaking, his accrued pay for an eight-month period of service amounted to less than one dollar. But in June of 1918, Private Kelly volunteered to be a runner for his commanding officer, arguably the most dangerous job of the war. Running messages and battle plans along the front lines, constantly dodging enemy artillery and machine gun fire. In battle after battle in the ensuing months across northern France, Private Kelly charged into the face of withering enemy fire, saving the lives of his comrades, leading attacks when officers were wounded, charging selflessly into enemy strongholds, and capturing enemy soldiers. The troubles he would get into between battles, while impatiently waiting for more action, were surpassed only by the citations and medals for extraordinary courage and bravery he would receive on battlefield after battlefield. Then on March 17, 1919, again, St. Patrick's Day, a year to the day from when he arrived in the trenches of Verdun, a year to the day when he received his third court-martial, Private John Joseph Kelly, while standing in a line with a host of Army generals receiving lesser awards, was personally presented the Congressional Medal of Honor by General John J. Pershing. After leaving the Army at war's end, Jackie Kelly went on to serve in the raucous Chicago politics of the Roaring Twenties. But he never could adapt to the normal routine of life. And despite receiving the nation's highest honor, his remaining years were difficult and undistinguished. He passed away in 1957, his moss-covered gravestone forgotten until a chance discovery by a group of Marines outside of Chicago. The men cleaned it up, 
and today Kelly ranks among the most highly honored of all American soldiers, one of only 19 men to receive our nation's highest honor twice. Harry Truman once remarked, I would rather have that medal than be President of the United States. General George Patton was even more passionate when he said, I'd give my immortal soul for that decoration. But Theodore Roosevelt once called it that infernal Medal of Honor. After tremendous bravery and what some would call the most conspicuous gallantry, as he led his Rough Rider charge on San Juan Hill in Cuba in 1898, Roosevelt went on to serve as President of the United States. But it was the Medal of Honor that he coveted more. Roosevelt pressured the Decorations Board who awarded the medal, and he enlisted powerful advocates in Congress, including the legendary Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, to push for his nomination to receive the Medal of Honor. Some say it was his very insistence that he deserved the medal that ultimately offended the Secretary of War, who summarily denied Roosevelt the honor. The President gave up his efforts and resigned himself to the fact that his cherished pursuit was finished. But 46 years later, as American troops stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day, one Teddy Roosevelt did indeed receive the Medal of Honor. Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. The president who was himself denied never lived to see America's highest honor bestowed on his own son. As President Franklin Roosevelt said that day of Teddy Roosevelt, Jr., his father would have been the proudest. Theodore Roosevelt, Sr., statesman, soldier, and president, was in fact awarded the Medal of Honor himself, 82 years after his death by President Clinton. At its core, the Medal of Honor is a representation of what we value most as Americans. So highly venerated is the medal that officers will stand when an enlisted medal recipient enters the room. The first Medals of Honor were bestowed on soldiers in 1863 during the Civil War. Initially conceived as an idea to gain additional recruits in the Navy, the medal was expanded to include other branches of service as well. By the turn of the century, though, many began to realize the need for an honor that stood above all others, something special, significant, almost sacred, that would recognize the best of the American character as displayed in the worst of modern events. In 1916, an Army Review Board rescinded 911 of the medals that had been awarded for deeds less than the new definitions they had developed, definitions which stand today as the most restrictive terms of any honor bestowed by the military. In the 1860s, when this was originated, it said ordinary Americans, it's really interesting, ordinary Americans from ordinary backgrounds who, under extraordinary circumstances and at great risk to their own lives, performed an incredible act or series of acts, conspicuous valor that clearly sets them apart from their comrades. Then later on, Congress refined this. And today, the criteria are along these lines. The act performed must have been one of personal bravery or self-sacrifice, so conspicuous as to clearly distinguish the individual above his comrades. It must involve risk of life. It must also be so outstanding that it clearly represents gallantry beyond the call of duty. Just a few years before Pearl Harbor, a young 15-year-old Hawaiian native 
and the son of Japanese immigrants, defied his Japanese teacher, who taught that no matter where they lived, the students were still Japanese. The student boldly challenged the teacher by insisting that first and foremost, he was an American. And so it has been from that day forward and throughout the life of Senator Daniel K. Inouye. On December 7, 1941, then 17 year old Daniel was one of the very first to rush into service at Pearl Harbor, caring for injured civilians on that fateful day. Fifteen months later, he left during his freshman year at the University of Hawaii and enlisted as a private in the U.S. Army's legendary 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the famed all-Japanese Gopher Broke Regiment. Within months, he was leading a combat platoon through some of the bloodiest campaigns of the war in southern France and Italy. In the closing months of the war, then-Lieutenant Inouye was seriously wounded while assaulting a heavily defended hill. Despite his injuries, he continued to lead his men, advancing alone against a machine gun nest, tossing hand grenades with devastating effect until his right arm was shattered by an enemy grenade. Continuing on, he threw his last grenade with his left hand before being hit again. Lieutenant Inouye spent the next 20 months in army hospitals after losing his right arm. After the war and his recovery, Inouye finished school and began what would become a storied career. First elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1959 and followed by election to eight consecutive terms to the United States Senate. 53 years later, on June 1, 2000, Daniel Inouye was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Bill Clinton. Standing beside him were six men and the families of 15 more, all worthy of the Medal of Honor, but originally denied because of their Japanese descent. As each became a recipient of our nation's highest honor, President Clinton reminded us they risked their lives above and beyond the call of duty. And in doing so, they did more than defend America. In the face of painful prejudice, they helped define America at its best. So I was gonna graduate from high school, maybe, and I was gonna be a laborer of some kind, probably a farmer. And so it never even crossed my mind anything like this was ever going to happen to me. I'm not a hero. I'm not a superhero by any means. Uh, I'm just a person who did something that had to be done at that moment. Uh, if I hadn't have done it, probably somebody else in my squad would have done it or in my platoon would have done it. They were just as much of a hero as I am, and I'm not a hero in anybody's, in any language. I just a, was an average soldier doing the job. Only a handful of Medal of Honor recipients ever became famous. Admiral Richard Byrd and Floyd Bennett received peacetime Medals of Honor for being the first to fly over the North Pole in 1927. Charles Lindbergh was honored with the medal by President Coolidge for his nonstop flight between New York and Paris. General Douglas MacArthur was honored for his service in World War II. 79 years earlier, General MacArthur's father, Lieutenant Arthur MacArthur, earned the Medal of Honor for his service during the Civil War at Missionary Ridge, Tennessee. And of course, men like Audie Murphy, Pappy Boyington, and Jimmy Doolittle have defined what it means to be a hero for generations. But the vast majority of recipients quietly returned home their names known but to a few friends and families. These guys came home and their heroism really lay ahead of them in a sense because what they did that was truly heroic was become citizens, become legislators, businessmen, fathers, husbands, pick up their lives and you know with a kind of understated heroism that they had exhibited in battle uh, build a society, build 
you know, America into the greatest country in the world. I blend in at home. I live in a little town of St. Pete Beach, Florida. And I doubt if there's four or five people in the entire town that I've lived there for 20 years that knows that I'm a Medal of Honor recipient. And I like it that way because I can blend in and be myself. Bill Crawford, enlisted man, World War II, like all of them, heroic, was awarded the Medal of Honor. Went back to his roots. I think he was originally from Pueblo, Colorado, but he ended up at Colorado Springs. Interesting career choice after the military. He went to work at the Air Force Academy as a janitor. Okay, Medal of Honor, janitor, doesn't matter. You do the best thing you can every day. So you think about all the kids going up and down those ladder wells, seeing the, seeing the janitor there, swabbing the decks, cleaning up, and never said boo to him, never. How are you, sir? Who are you, what, what's your background? Until they found out that he was a Medal of Honor recipient. That guy that they walked up and down, you know, these hot shot, soon to be wing wiper jet drivers, and here was a true American hero. Rocky Versace was a remarkable young man right from the start. The son of a career army officer and the oldest of five children, Rocky debated between a career in the military or entering the priesthood. Ultimately, he chose to follow his father, and after graduating from West Point and an initial tour of duty in Korea, in 1962, Rocky became one of the first military advisors to the fledgling South Vietnamese Army. Rocky fell in love with Vietnam, its people, and especially its children. I mean, he simply adopted them all as, as, his, as his family. I mean, it just all the Vietnamese people that he knew, he just really loved, and he was very caring about them. As in Korea, he became deeply involved during his off-duty hours in helping to build an orphanage. But as the war intensified, so did his commitment to helping the struggling South Vietnamese Army preserve a democratic country, a cause in which Versace was totally committed. So too was he committed to his plan to become a priest after his military service and return to help the Vietnamese orphans he had grown to love. With less than three weeks remaining before starting his new career, the Viet Cong ambushed the South Vietnamese battalion Rocky was helping. Versace and two other Americans stood their ground and held off the superior Viet Cong force as long as possible until they were finally overwhelmed and taken prisoner. As told by his captured comrades, from the beginning of his imprisonment, Rocky demonstrated a level of courage simply never seen before. With fluency in both French and Vietnamese, Rocky vehemently challenged their communist propaganda. And when they started interrogating him, he would they would interrogate him in three languages. And then they finally started in, interrogating him only in, in English because the guards, they began to respect him. This continually focused his captor's wrath onto himself and away from his men. It led to month after month of unrelenting beatings and unspeakable torture. Four times he tried to escape, only to result in more months of torture. He was segregated from the prisoner, the rest of the prisoners, because he was too dominant a force and they couldn't break him, so they didn't want him influencing the other prisoners. And they would have never survived if it hadn't been for Rock because they'd have all taken the same kind of treatment that he did. With the beatings and deprivation having finally reduced his body weight in half, emaciated and with bones protruding, Versace was paraded through villages on a leash to prove the vulnerability of the Americans. They used to drag him through villages. They'd have a rope around his neck and dragging him through villages, and he was jaundiced, and of course they weren't feeding him. And he, all the villagers would report when they were reported to the, the military intelligence was this, this man that was being dragged around had this wonderful smile on his face. 
and would, would say such nice things to them as he was being dragged through these villages. It was just rock. It's just the way he was. But as his men reported, he never gave in. His stubborn defiance never faltered. Then, on September 26, 1965, the Viet Cong came for Rocky Versace. And as they led him off to the swamps for execution, Rocky, courageous and faithful to the very end, was heard by all singing God Bless America at the top of his lungs. Today there remains a modest statue of Rocky Versace at a small recreation center for children in Alexandria, Virginia. His Medal of Honor is enshrined there as well. Inscribed beneath his likeness are the simple words, a kid from the neighborhood who had the faith and never gave in. I don't know, heroes, it's, who are the heroes? Heroes are the ones that are, the saints that are listed in Hebrews 11 or something. The ones that we don't follow, we just, they're, I don't know, we throw a, I don't know how to say that. The heroes are the ones are the nurses and the doctors that keep these kids alive. I see the kids at Balboa Hospital, their parent or their wives being there every single day dealing with their young kid husband they just married to and he's not the same when he got back home. They're the ones that are the heroes, the, the ones that you never mentioned. The word hero means. I don't know how. It has been said that real heroes don't seek recognition. Their acts of bravery generally take place under circumstances which permit no thought of medals or special awards. So why did they do it? According to historian Peter Collier, some talked of entering a zone of slow motion invulnerability, where they were spectators at their own heroism. They often say of athletes who are quote unquote in the zone, so these guys were in the zone at some point. I mean, they will be the first to tell you that this was almost an out of body experience for them. This is not what they are. This is something that they became for a brief instant because that instant demanded it of them. And so the question is, what was it in them that made them step forward? And it's a variety of things. I mean, some of them say, you know, they were in the hands of God. They felt that they were in the hands of God. They were, you know, not in some sense in full control of their actions, that these actions were being dictated from without. Some of them felt that they were just angry because they had lost a comrade or something. And they, they said, the hell with this. You know, I'm not going to let this stand. While some men survived, more than two-thirds of all Medal of Honor recipients were killed in the action having led to their honor. Men like Howard Gilmore. In February 1943, Commander Gilmore was at the helm of the USS Growler, a submarine in its fourth war patrol in the Pacific. On the night of February 7th, the Growler had surfaced and was tracking a Japanese target. The armed merchant ship turned and tried to ram the submarine with Gilmore and four of his men working from the sub's conning tower. It was reported that the Japanese were shooting pieces off the submarine. Gilmore reacted quickly. He saw to it that the other wounded men were handed below, and realizing that he could never make it to the hatch in time to save the submarine, he gave the order to his men to take it down while he remained on deck. Gilmore was lost alone at sea to save 69 men under his charge. First of all, a German SS officer, the commandant, when we arrived, he made a speech, a half of us was dead already marching, and he said that you, Jews, None of you are going to get out alive. My older sister tried to stop her. Mom, don't go. Mom, don't go. But she went with the sister. So both of them went to the gas ship. 
Then my father made it through Auschwitz, and he ended up in Buchenwald, and he got killed there. By age 13, Hungarian-born Tibor Rubin understood despair, hopelessness, and the horrors of war in a very personal way. In 1942, he and his family were rounded up by the Nazis and taken to concentration camps, where his mother, father, and sister were all executed. But for 14 months, young Tibor survived all the odds. After being liberated in 1945 from the Malthausen camp in Austria, he made a solemn promise to himself that if he ever made it to America, he would show his undying appreciation to this great land by enlisting in the very army that liberated him. I promised myself, if a Lord helped me go United States, I gonna become a G.I. Joe. Soon after the war, Tybor made good on his pledge, and even though he was not a U.S. citizen, he joined the American Army. When the Korean War broke out, Corporal Rubin's regiment was mobilized. But because he wasn't an American citizen, Rubin was left behind. He said, we're going to send you Japan or Germany. I said, I cannot go to the safe zone because, first of all, I'm a G.I. Joe now. And I made a promise. And I said, a lot of guys was with me in basic training. I said, I cannot, cannot stay, go any safe zone because it wouldn't be right. In Korea, the conditions were brutal, the fighting intense, and the bitter cold unrelenting. Near the end of October 1950, Rubin and his men were overwhelmed by thousands of Chinese troops. Their firepower had dwindled down to one exposed machine gun. Corporal Rubin stepped in. For hours, this lone rifleman would defend against a massive number of North Korean forces. He fought alone until his ammunition was gone and badly wounded, he was captured and sent to a POW camp. Reuben and his men spent the next 30 months as prisoners of war. But having lived through the unspeakable horrors of the Nazi concentration camps, Reuben knew ways to survive. He made soup from grass, medicine from weeds. He stole vegetables from his captors and nursed countless dying men back to life. You know, I come from a Jewish family, we were a religious family, and my mother was very religious, and he always told us, we all brothers and sisters, there is only one God, you call him whatever you want to, but you have to help your brothers and sisters. And that's a big mitzvah, my mother used to have. Mitzvah means you do a good deed, she said, better than you go pray every day the temple because you're helping someone. And that's what I did. His refusal to give up and the hope that sprang eternal within him gave the courage to his men to fight on. One of his fellow soldiers remarked, Tybor was one of the best ever to wear our nation's uniform. Fifty-five years later, on September 24, 2005, President George W. Bush presented the Medal of Honor to 76-year-old Tybor Rubin. This only can happen in the United States. I always tell everybody, if this was Russia, they would send me probably in a Siberia coal mine. You know what I mean? In America, I got the Medal of Honor, you know? This mean, you know, is a tremendous thing for a little guy like me. God damn it, all of honor. This only can happen in America. A few days later, my citations started moving around through Eighth Army, and some general called up and wanted to know you know, what they'd done to me to keep me alive, you know. And my colonel told him I was still up on the line, wouldn't come off. And he, so the general ordered me off. And uh, so I told my, uh, my uh, colonel, I said, would you please tell that general 
that I ain't coming off the damn line until my regiment does. And if he's worried about the medal, he can have the medal because yeah, I don't need it and I'm going to stay here. So I never left a line until the end of April when my regiment left. It has been said that ours is the first generation of Americans who doesn't have heroes. Role models, maybe. But the idea of American heroes, to many, sounds dated. Something of a bygone era that no longer applies to this fast-paced modern world. But William Carney was a hero. William Carney sought no recognition in his lifetime. Instead, he wanted to be a minister. But with the thunder of war ravaging his beloved America, and the call for black soldiers to join the fight in the Civil War, he said, I felt I could best serve my God by serving my country and my oppressed brothers. William Carney went on to serve as part of the USCT, the United States Colored Troops, as they were called then, a group of individuals fighting not just for the idea of freedom, but for real freedom in the wake of slavery and oppression. On July 18, 1863, Carney's USCT Company C of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry was engaged in a brutal assault on Fort Wagner, South Carolina. As the men advanced, a Confederate bullet struck the flag bearer of the 54th Infantry. Far from being a ceremonial position, Carney understood that the regiment's colors were critical to issue commands and move the troops forward. He threw down his weapon and seized the flag racing to the front of the advancing troops. By the battle's end, Kearney had been struck five times, in the head, chest, legs, and one arm. As Kearney slowly made his way to the rear, colors in hand, he staggered amongst his men. Collapsing from wounds, he proudly announced, boys, the old flag never touched the ground. William Kearney would become the first African American to receive the Medal of Honor. The recipients of our nation's highest honor represent a cross-section of American culture. Many would have led quiet, unremarkable lives, but for the forces of history which thrust them into a conflict they never saw coming. These Medal of Honor moments, when an ordinary man displays extraordinary courage, prove that any of us are able to attain the best of the American character, even those who never raised a weapon. If there is a pecking order, and I'm not sure they would want me to talk about this, but it, if there were a pecking order, I think that the number one group that they admire, medics. A medic is out there with no weapon, unprotected. It was like an Iwo Jima. Woody Williams would talk about, you know, you're not, the Japanese weren't getting off that island, but they wanted to take 10 Marines with them. And if you, can, if you can get a medic down, you can lose those 10 Marines pretty quick. When Desmond Doss was a small boy, he saw a poster of the Old Testament Bible story of Cain and Abel, with Cain standing over the body of the brother he had killed. From that moment on, young Desmond determined that he would never, under any circumstances, take the life of another human being. As he grew, he became devoutly committed to his faith, to the power of prayer, to the Bible as a source of strength. In 1942, with America entering World War II, Desmond Doss was determined to serve his country. Although declared a conscientious objector, he refused to take a deferment and joined the Army to serve as a medic. From the first day of training, the men of Doss's unit knew he was different kneeling at his bunk in prayer, always reading the Bible, Desmond drew increasing taunts and harassment from his fellow soldiers. With the war at hand and with a new recruit that wouldn't carry a gun, eat meat, or work on the Sabbath, Doss's commanding officer tried unsuccessfully to declare him unstable and unsuitable for military service. But Doss was dedicated to serving, and while refusing to take another life or even to carry a gun, he was fast becoming an outstanding soldier, passionately dedicated to providing medical aid to all in need. Initially deployed to Guam, then to the vicious battles at Lai Ti, 
His fellow soldiers were astonished as time after time Doss would selflessly charge into open areas alive with machine gun fire and sniper fire to rescue a wounded man. Then came the historic Battle of Okinawa in April 1945. The Japanese were dug in all over the island, and Doss's 77th Division had to scale a 400-foot cliff, honeycombed with caves, tunnels, and enemy gun emplacements. When the order came to attack, Doss told his lieutenant the men should pray before the assault, that prayer was the best lifesaver of all. And with Doss having proved his courage over and over, his men were more than receptive to doing just that. They struggled up the sheer face of the escarpment only to be pinned down by withering enemy fire. They were immediately forced to engage the enemy in a fierce battle. And by day's end, Doss's company was victorious, without a single man killed and only one minor injury. It was, in fact, miraculous. Even at Army headquarters back in the States, everyone asked how Company B of the 77th had pulled it off. Finally, with no other rational explanation, the official U.S. Army report stated simply that, quote, Doss prayed. On May 5th, however, the tide turned against the Americans. Enemy soldiers swarmed out of their caves and charged in every direction. Immediately, 75 men were wounded and Company B had to fall back to the base of the escarpment. The only soldiers to remain at the top of the cliff were the wounded, the Japanese, and Corporal Desmond Doss. For five continuous hours, after affixing a rope to a tree, one by one, he lowered each and every wounded soldier from his company down to safety. The Army estimated that the conscientious objector, who had been tormented and harassed, and who had been nearly discharged as unfit, single-handedly saved the lives of over 75 of his men. As one writer said, he had fought a good fight, his own way, without ever compromising his strong beliefs. On October 12, 1945, Corporal Desmond Doss was invited to the White House, where around his neck the President placed the Medal of Honor. And my privilege to have met a number of these people through the years would say the hallmark of most of them is quiet and modesty. When I was a boy, these, these Medal of Honor winners were also kind of household names. They were the people we looked to when we talked about, you know, values and, you know, simple human values in addition to, you know, valor and heroism, simple human values. I think that we've gone through a, a patch in, in our society where, you know, we found um, as a result of the Vietnam War and the anti-Americanism that was the residue uh, of the protest against it, we've devalued our military heroes. And so as a consequence, a lot of the, the Medal of Honor winners today um, are in the shadows of our society. And it, it would be to our society's benefit to see them come out of the shadows. Bob Howard one day, I was in Seattle, and he was doing an outreach class with a bunch of kids. And he had a young girl in the front row. And they had been prepared for what his topic was. And she answered the question, raised her hand right up, and gave this great answer. And he, they have challenge coins, some of them, most of them, that they keep with them. And he pulled out one of his challenge coins, and it embedded in it will have his conflict, his name. They're beautiful and, you know, collectible. and. He, they bring them, some of them, to these educational outreaches. And he took the coin and he flipped it to the young lady. And he looked at her uh, and he pointed his finger at her and he said, you will do something with your life that will make me proud of you. And she said, I will. And he said, you have no choice. You will do something with your life and you will do the right thing. You will not disappoint me. I know you won't. And I thought, I think you just changed a person's life right there. Yes, it took great courage for Sammy Davis with a broken back 
to grab three of his, his buddies and pull them uh, to safety. It took enormous courage and strength for Mike Thornton being shot, swimming with two people, him being shot for three hours. But the, the crux, the kernel, the thing that I think America sees in these men and in their stories is selflessness. In a world today where it's celebrity and it's spotlight and you're famous for being famous, here are these people who save, you know, people have families today, if you think about it, because these men save them. A New York Times writer once grappled with the question of whether there are more medal recipients in the making even today. In future wars, he said, fewer men will be engaged. They will be more heavily armed. They will strike from a distance. But there will be a need for a sudden flare of valor, the instinctive assertion of leadership in danger. He said, the voice of the hero will again be heard calling to his men. The Medal of Honor is an attempt to identify, celebrate, and preserve those elements of the American character that we believe shine above all others. It is a snapshot of what it looks like to be a perfect American, if only for one instant. It seems fitting in these United States of America, a land without royalty, where the people reign supreme, and the everyday man and woman is of singular importance, that the actions and people we choose to honor above all others look like us, talk like us, think like us, and are, in every sense of the word, the same as us. A more fitting testimony could not be found to the faith and courage of our people and the sacrifice that has made ours a great nation than our nation's most sacred award, the Medal of Honor.